Okay, so I think I'm recording now. Yeah. Uh, so on behalf of uh, National University of Management uh, International College and NUM Social Innovation Lab, uh, we're very pleased this evening to have uh, Tom Moss joining us for our special guest speaker series. Uh, Tom is a serial uh, entrepreneur and executive with deep hardware and software experience. He is a former Android executive at Google from 2007 to 2010, founder and CEO at uh, 3LM, which was acquired by Motorola, founder and CEO of Nextbit, which was acquired by Razor. Tom is one of the first investors at Skydio, serving as its COO from 2018 to 2020, and currently serving as CEO of Skydio Japan and Asia Pacific. Skydio, the maker of the world's most advanced uh, autonomous drones, has a valuation, according to Forbes, of about $1 billion. And they also recently raised $170 million very, uh, via a Series D, um, uh, yeah, very, very uh, sorry, via a Series D round led by Anderson and Horowitz. So we're therefore very pleased to have Tom uh, join us this evening to, to deliver his talk in conversation on Skydio and the future of drones. So let me pass it to you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, everybody, and uh, I appreciate your time. I'll try to keep a fairly brief, maybe 15 minute uh, overview of just of the history of Skydio, the company, and kind of the history and the products. And then I think after that, we'll have a kind of a fireside chat or a QA. Um, so I'm happy to talk about anything that's interesting to, to the audience here. I wasn't sure. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep it light on the technical uh, details. We can dive, dive into some of those if you want, or, or the history of the company, um, you know, fundraising or Silicon Valley in general. I've just further background, I've, you know, I've been in tech now since about 2005. And like Jeff, uh, actually, we both started uh, as, as social deviants known as attorneys. Uh, we were both lawyers. Uh, we were both doing, um, uh, you know, uh, law in, in Silicon Valley with technology companies. That's how we got our start. Um, I originally actually joined Google as an attorney and then switched over to the business side. Uh, I was the attorney for Android and then um, switched over to the business side to help kind of draw, uh, build that ecosystem out. And that's how I got my start on kind of the business side of things uh, and then became an entrepreneur uh, a few years after that as well. So happy to talk through uh, anything or everything that's interesting, but I do think it'd be good to kind of set the ground a little bit or background about Skydio and what's happening in drones because I do think it's, it's interesting and it's not really... Uh, covered a lot. I think um, drones, you know, were really hot about five, six years ago. Um, and there's kind of a lot of excitement around it in the industry. Um, some of it well placed, some of it not. Um, we believe one of the missing ingredients um, in kind of realizing a lot of that potential was autonomy. And I'll talk about that. And that's kind of the core focus of our company. Um, but I think drones are interesting again, but we're seeing a lot of focus now in terms of press mindshare and even political mindshare. Uh, from regulatory uh, authorities and, and politicians for delivery, you know, drones for delivery or for un unmanned taxis, UAMs uh, and, and the such. But I think there's actually uh, much more kind of high scale, high volume opportunities in drones that are that are uh, coming into effect right now that are more interesting, but don't really get covered. Um, in the press, I'll talk about some of that as well for the work that we're doing at Skydo. So let me try and uh, share my screen. And let me do a... Yeah, I think you should be a co-host, so you should be able to share. So just let me yeah. know. Yeah, I'm just looking. I'm used to, uh, we use Google, so I'm not <laughs> sure how to share just a single tab, but I won't. I'll just share my screen instead then. So, uh, all right. So you get to see my, uh, <laughs> my control tabs. Okay, can you? Yes, we can see the slides now. Yeah. Is that coming across okay? Can you see my screen? Perfect, yeah. Oh, wonderful, okay. Um, so I'll try to keep this fairly brief, but um, drones, you know, which are essentially robots with video cameras on them that fly around, uh, create a lot of beautiful visual content. So there are uh, quite a few videos as part of any Skydio presentation. Um, if they don't come across, if the videos stutter and they're not working, let me know and we can kind of, uh, I could just skip through the videos and we could share links later, but hopefully it'll come through because I think, you know, the audio visual is, is an important part of the story. Um, we went through my background. So Skydio is a company, our mission is fairly simple. Uh, we wanna make the world more productive, creative and safe with autonomous flight. And you'll see through our products that actually that, that we, we're um, kind of, you know, we're, we're making products that really focus on that mission um, in terms of increased productivity, creativity and safety uh, through the power of autonomous flight. 
Um, as background, you know, we are now by volume the leading U.S. drone manufacturer. Um, that's um, still much, much smaller than the world champion uh, out of China, which is DJI. But uh, we are the first company in, uh, gosh, at least five years, I think, to, to, to be a credible challenger in the arena. Um, you know, there's a lot of attempts, especially by, by several U.S. companies in the consumer drone space that didn't really um, work out eventually. And so Skydio, you know, through our focus on autonomy and that differentiation that we bring, um, we have managed to kind of, um, you know, focus on a specific type of use case uh, and really nail that and provide something that is a generation or more ahead of, of anything else out there. And that's enabled us to kind of grow, um, you know, very steadily and very successfully from that kind of base in a very kind of traditional, uh, you know, bridging the chasm type of a focus for a startup, right? We, we focused on nailing one thing um, that was actually very, very hard to nail uh, and have used that to grow. And I'll kind of weave that story uh, as I talk a little bit more about our history. Um, but I think the first thing to, to make clear is that, um, as I mentioned, we're an autonomy company. Autonomy um, for drones is, is very difficult. It's basically, we create fully self, uh, self flying drones. So think about, you know, level five autonomy for cars. It's simpler in that obviously we fly, we have less, uh, cases where, you know, if we see a ball, uh, like a, as opposed to a car, when we see a ball coming down the street, you might need to learn to infer that there might be a child falling, chasing that ball. And so you might want to slow down. You know, we have a lot less of those types of cases to deal with because we're flying. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the technology that we built is, is fully self, uh, flying autonomous drones. And this work actually goes back 12 years where our, uh, founders, our CEO and CTO met as graduate students at MIT university. Uh, in the United States, uh, where they worked at the AI lab as graduate students. And this is actually their graduate thesis from 2012 when they graduated. This is a fixed wing plane flying in a parking lot uh, autonomously, right? This is pre-mapped uh, and this was using uh, light or, or razor, lasers, excuse me. Uh, but still, you know, this was kind of stated, or this was the state of the art 12 years ago. And so our founders really have been at the forefront of this technology for a very long time. Um, Skydio itself was founded in 2014. Uh, I take pride, actually, I wasn't one of, I was literally the first investor. <laughs> so I wrote the first check uh, that the company got. Um, it's a moment of pride for me, for me now. Um, and uh, from 2014 to 2018, it was purely R&D, you know, working towards the first product. Uh, and uh, again, the focus really was on autonomy. And so the use case that the company focused on as the first use case to nail was being an autonomous film crew uh, for people to have on them um, to have filming them, excuse me, when they're doing interesting activities. So if you think about, um, you know, the evolution of cameras, you know, uh, over the past hundred years, let's say from from the different kind of form factors all the way to to digital cameras and then to smartphones now eventually, uh, every form of photography that you're kind of used to on a consumer level, you are you or the person filming is behind the camera, right? And so you're you're you know separated from the scene or from what's happening in the real world. What we did is provide a essentially a robot cameraman or a robot helicopter that would film you, um, and so allow you to be in your moment and perform your activities, but be filmed while you're doing that. And so, in order to make that possible, um, in a, in a smooth way, we had to create um, a much higher level of autonomy than than things were available at the time. So this video is from uh, 2017. It, it's it shows the development of the technology for our first product, the R1, that launched in 2018. What you see, first of all, in the top right corner, you see uh, the drone separating uh, what is the human in the scene and what is not, right? So it's able to semantically understand what a human is and separate and know that, you know, the rest of this environment is not the human. This red thing, that's the human. That's what I care about. That's my subject that I'm going to be filming. Uh, it's still mapping the world in 3D around it in real time. It's understanding you know, um, that there's static objects all around the scene, that it has to avoid these static objects as it flies. But it also understands beyond that, that it has to keep this human uh, in focus because that's the target. And in order to do that, not only does it have to map its environment and create its own flight path to get to where the human is, it has to actually predict where that human is going to be in the future, right? So it uses a model of that human being, the pose data, the history of it uh, to predict. And that red arrow that you're seeing, that's the prediction that the drone is making about where that human is about to go. And the blue is, is the history of the trail, right? So in real time, you have a drone that is not only at 360 degrees, capturing depth data in order to map a very accurate uh, point cloud around it. It also 
identifies that there's a human in the scene, knows to follow that human, and, and, and does so by predicting the movement of that. And it does so all of this uh, locally on the device itself. So we're not using the cloud to do this. This is all done on the GPU that is inside the drone in a very lightweight, um, power efficient package, right? And so that's really the core technology of the company. And so that was, uh, like I said, 2017. Uh, that led to our first hardware product, the R1, that came out in 2018. And then in October of 2019, uh, we introduced Skydio 2, which is really a step up uh, in every possible way in terms of the, the, the quality of the AI, the follow capabilities, and the drone itself. So I just wanted to share this, this video that we did for the launch. <laughs> Just to show that it's not all just what we did. This is a third party. This is a, that this a compilation of third party exists. reviews. This is just some next gen futuristic ass shit right here. This drone is an incredibly intelligent autonomous flying machine. You can confidently go in and get the shots you want and not have to worry about hitting obstacles. No way I would have done that with my DJI drone. The fact that they're this sophisticated in a machine that can fly to navigate, to avoid obstacles, can recognize people, to me is just mind blowing. It's been the most fun that I've had playing with a drone since drones came out on the market many, many years ago. But this is the future. This is the next 10, 20 years of our evolution around electronics that are in this drone today. So getting uh, this kind of consumer value proposition right uh, allowed us to, uh, you know, enter the market in, in a pretty large, uh, volume use case uh, target market, right? The addressable market uh, for this type of consumer drone uh, is fairly large and, and succeeding in, in nailing the product and getting the price point right and everything allowed us to grow. And that's how we became the number one uh, drone manufacturer in the United States. Uh, but the autonomy um, from the beginning we knew was useful like 
uh, for many other purposes as well. If you go back to our mission statement, uh, you know, obviously on the consumer side, we make the world more creative, but we also want to make it more productive and more safe. And so um, with the success of Skydia 2 in the consumer market, we then turned our attention to growing our company also in the enterprise and public sector and defense space as well. Um, and we try to leverage the same core autonomy functionality that allows it, the drone to see the world around it, map it, uh, semantically understand the scene that it's seeing and, and navigate flight paths in order to, to build uh, additional functionality that would make us useful uh, in these sectors as well. So um, we have a few different software packages. So we take the same drone, uh, same hardware, but through software, um, we add enhanced capabilities, right, that are uh, available for purchase separately from the drone hardware itself by an enterprise or a government uh, workforce that allow the drone to have additional functionalities that make it more suitable or a better uh, tool for this kind of use cases. So here's a quick, just a uh, video on that. And then to kind of help further, uh, sorry. So one of the unique aspects of our drones is because we made a bet on vision as our system for how we navigate around the world as opposed to um, traditional methods that rely on GPS, um, primarily on GPS and a magnetometer. Um, we have certain characteristics that make us uniquely suitable for certain types of inspection uh, type work or environments specifically uh, we can navigate, um, well, we have GPS uh, available on the drone uh, for positioning information uh, when you want to do waypoint missions outdoors, et cetera. We can operate completely uh, without GPS, and so in GPS denied environments. So primarily indoors, but also if you think about uh, inspecting things like bridges that are, you know, these massive metal structures, um, drones don't have access to GPS when they're inspecting the bottom parts of the bridge, which is the most important part. Uh, that you want to be inspected, you want to be flying up in there. Um, and uh, other drones aren't able to be used for that because of their uh, reliance on GPS. And so we have a lot of traction already in uh, infrastructure inspection, specifically around things like bridges, uh, electro, uh, magnet, uh, sorry, uh, power utility um, generators, et cetera, which, which generate electromagnetic interference that we're also immune to, uh, and other types of kind of uh, large infrastructure uh, that needs to be inspected. And 
one of the more recent technologies that we bring to market is um, the ability to inspect these types of assets, this infrastructure assets or any kind of structure really, fully autonomously, right? So using the autonomy that we've developed um, and kind of enhancing it to now uh, not just uh, identify people or cars, but any 3D structure uh, that you identify through the interface and then create a 3D uh, digital twin of that asset. And so that's technology that we're bringing to market over the next couple of months called 3D scan. Just do a quick loops. Kind of hard to understand, but the drone is basically building a completely accurate photogrammetry recreation of the asset uh, that that you can then uh, interface interact with, excuse me, through a web viewer and kind of have this uh, extremely accurate reproduction of a digital reproduction, which then you can annotate uh, issues on. You can run change detection on, uh, you know, crack detection, rust detection, other kinds of uh, functionality on the back end. To, to really help you get a very accurate, uh, up-to-date model of any kind of piece of, of infrastructure. And, um, you know, this, this I'll get to actually, maybe I should, yeah, sorry. Um, it's saving, I'll get a little bit of this in, in, in a bit, but it saves just a ton of time and money uh, compared to traditional methods. So basically the, you know, with our autonomy, uh, it requires a lot less training for pilots. So you can get up in the air faster. It's safer and easier to fly because of our collision avoidance. Uh, uh, we have far less crashes. We can go uh, because of the fact that we're immune to electromagnetic interference and we don't rely on GPS. We can fly uh, pretty much anywhere and we can fly in very close because of our uh, autonomy-based collision avoidance. You can get into very tight, small spaces and still fly with confidence that you won't crash. Uh, and then we can automate workflows. And so that's kind of been the core of our enterprise offering that we bring to market uh, over the past year. Um, and so, as I mentioned in the beginning, there's a lot of hype about drones because they bring a lot of promise, but really without autonomy, um, uh, oh, sorry, there's a lot of uh, promise for drones because they're so much more effective and cheaper, even manually flown drones are so much more effective and cheaper than uh, what the methods that were used historically. So if you think about Overwatch using police helicopters, you know, having to get a helicopter crew up running or towers, uh, for example, cell phone towers or power towers, right? You have to have people up there really climbing uh, taking pictures. And then, of course, for bridges, uh, it's a, quite an ordeal. Uh, the traditional method of bridge inspection, where you would close down one direction of traffic, you would have what they're called these snooper trucks, or you would have people repelling on ropes, and they would be taking pictures of this infrastructure. Um, and you can replace all this with manually flown drones, and it's much safer uh, and much cheaper. Um, but it still uh, requires, you know, having trained pilots and having an inspector. Uh, and so there's still um, while manually flown drones are still a significant improvement over the previous methods that have been used so far, uh, autonomy uh, really makes it that much more scalable, that much more cheaper, and that much more safer because you don't have to have a skilled pilot. You, um, you know, can, can scale it uh, much cheaper, and you don't have to worry about crashes or anything like that. Obviously, crashes are the number one risk of concerns for why enterprise customers don't want to use drones uh, for certain types of inspections. And so just having that that peace of mind in itself is, is, is huge, but also again, just the scalability of, you don't need to have a trained pilot, anybody can take a drone and then have the drone do a fully automated workflow, uh, just really unleashes the potential uh, at much more than, than ever before. And so if we kind of think about an evolution of drones, you know, they really started off as toys that were, you know, based on, you know, RC kind of helicopters and RC airplanes, became, you know, put a camera on it, it became this kind of manual drone era that was dominated um, by DJI. Uh, but now because of uh, enhancements in kind of the AI and, and autonomy portion of it, they can be completely soft, software driven uh, experiences. They no longer require a skilled operator. Um, they can execute missions completely on their own and do it in a much safer and much uh, more complete manner than, than, than a human pilot could. Um, and so with autonomy, you know, existing use cases are easier, more liable. 
There are more use cases now with drones that you can do because of the fact that you can operate in GPS denied environments or close to power structures. Uh, and so drones become safer, cheaper, and above all, significantly more scalable. And so we really think uh, when we kind of talk about the future of drones, you know, um, there's a huge generational shift now from the manual drones that you might think of that have been kind of the, the, the typical drone for the last five years and what's going to come uh, or what is here now from Skydio and is coming in the future, which is you know, fully software-driven autonomous drones. And we consider this as big of a change in the drone world as you know, kind of flip phones uh, to smartphones were in the mobile world, right? So the ability to just um, build a skill or application you know, uh, for a specific type of job that you want a drone to perform is now completely possible right, on our platform, right? So we can take this drone and using the autonomy kind of foundation that we have, we can build additional capabilities over time that really take these and, and turn these to fully automated flying robots that, that can kind of take on a lot of dangerous tasks that can go where you know humans might be too dangerous for humans, or they can just go faster than a human, um, you know, uh, or they could you know perform missions nonstop uh, as opposed to humans. So there's just a lot of benefits to automating this. And this is really going to open up, you know, uh, the industry in general towards more and more uh, application for drones. Uh, in things such as inspection and security patrol, search and rescue, um, you know, post-disaster and all these kinds of other use cases. Um, this is really gonna drive that forward. And so we're really seeing an explosion in those types of use cases now, thanks to the power of, of autonomous drones. And so that's kind of my quick overview uh, of, of Skydio and kind of the history of the company. I, you know, I want it to be fairly brief. Uh, I don't know if I accomplished my mission or not. I don't know if that was too long or too short. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I tried to balance it. Um, and so I, uh, let me, I see there's a couple of questions here. So why don't I get uh, to it first? Can I return to the starting location? Yes. So you can set uh, a rally point or a home point, or it'll return to where the controller is with the phone, the, the person with the phone is. It'll return to, you can, you can decide uh, ahead of time if you want it to return to a specific point, or if you want it to return to whoever has the phone that's controlling it. Um, the kilometers, so for the Skydio 2 with the controller, I think we get to about three kilometers, three and a half kilometers. And with the X2, I think we get somewhere between six to eight kilometers in ideal ideal conditions. Uh, and then the flight time is uh, 24 minutes on the Skydio 2 and five minutes on the X2, which is the big plan, which um, uh, is a long time in the thermal camp, uh, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, so Steve, I know if you want to, uh, See if there's any more immediate questions. If you want to jump to the kind of Q and A with you first, or sure. but I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Well, let me just go to our. I think it's good just to go to the audience. And by the way, that was the videos were really cool, right? That was I didn't realize the amount of autonomy that you were using in the product. So that was oh, great. Uh, and and then also the focus sort of on the the thesis at MIT of the original founders in that was was quite fascinating. So let me just open it up to. Would be great if you guys can ask questions also with the mic, not just in the chat. But uh, let's see how that goes. But do we have any uh, some questions to start it off? I mean, Jerry. I've got one. But yeah, thanks, Thomas. It's cool to hear about all of that. It's nice to hear about a, a non DJI name that is also making really, really cool stuff. Uh, and I, which actually is related to my question, which is in, in a, a market that is obviously booming right now and there's so much potential there, um, one of the downsides of that is that it means it's going to be fiercely competitive. So, well, how does that, what does, that look like for you guys how do you what's your strategy to to differentiate um is, is it autonomy are you and is will that uh sustain will be able to sustain that lead in the future i guess yeah it's, it's a great question um it is you're correct it is autonomy and i think it's very difficult i i think i've seen this so um we mentioned briefly that I, I, so I, was, I was an executive on the, on the Android team at Google from 2007, 2010. So 2007 was about a year and a half before we launched our first phone uh, is when I started working on Android. And then I left uh, late 2010 to start my own company. And, and by then we were uh, on a global basis kind of starting to dominate. Um, and obviously, you know, before us um, or before Android and before Apple came up with the iPhone, you know, Nokia was the dominant phone company in the world. Motorola was up there as well. Obviously in the enterprise, you had research in motion. Uh, it was a very car carrier dominated ecosystem. 
uh, and the world just looked a lot, you know, more different. And, and it didn't seem like Nokia was really assailable, right? I mean, there were articles I could show you covers, right, about about Nokia just being the most unassailable company ever, and, and that's it. And, and phones were basically done, and, and Nokia was going to walk away with it. Um, and then, of course, now Nokia is is a, you know, uh, I think a three time uh, kind of pass along brand that now is owned by uh, Foxconn. Right, that's HMD, I believe, is the subsidiary that they created to own that brand, and and, and they're not really a a, a player uh, anymore. Base, and and we think that's the same thing is going to happen is starting to happen now with with drones, and I think it's for the same reasons, right? Which is this move from from um, kind of hardware focus to software focus, and I think it's a really difficult uh, move for a lot of companies, as we saw again in the smartphone space, I think it's really difficult to move from being a hardware company that has a roadmap for software features. Uh, that's kind of part of a checklist, almost of features and a waterfall model of, you know, we're gonna build a drone and it's gonna have this distance, we're gonna have this battery life, and we'd like to have this level of autonomy. Um, and that's really, really difficult to do well versus our approach, um, which was completely software driven, the entire design of the drone is built around the capabilities of, of autonomy and software. So literally, the, like the design, you know, how it's um, the shape, but also where the cameras are placed, where the propellers are placed, everything like that is built specifically um, in line with what the current state of our autonomy capabilities are. Uh, and so it's designed from the ground specifically for that. And we think that's the only way to really achieve the level of autonomy that we provide. And so far, at least, um, you know, it's, we haven't seen anybody replicate that approach because, you know, it takes, it's really difficult once you have a sustaining uh, business that's built on kind of iterating on the same kind of hardware roadmap every year to then check it out completely and be like, no, we're going to go from a software centric approach and, and design a completely new throughout everything we've done kind of on hardware and start scratch from what does the autonomy need in order to be successful and start from there. Um, and so we think culturally, this is going to be a really difficult shift for other companies to make. Um, obviously there's companies with a lot of resources that are entering the space or in the space already like DJI. And so you can't count them out. But um, I think we are part of or catalyzing this shift. And, and right now I think it's really um, up to us how well we execute rather than, than what competitors do because I think it'll be a few years before any competitor really, really catches up to us. Great, thanks for that answer. I think we are getting some questions in the chat. Uh, uh, let's see, particularly excited about any use case of the product. Yeah, um, uh, the obviously the 3D scan, I think that I showed the video of is, is extremely cool, uh, but I'm also really excited about um, uh, security patrol. If you think about, um, we have a, a, a product that I didn't talk about too much because it's not coming out uh, for a little bit yet, but it's a dock, which is uh, a, basically a, a base station for the drone. But the drone can autonomously take off from, execute a, a mission, be inspection or patrol, uh, and come back and land, or you can teleoperate it remotely if you want in, in real time as opposed to doing an automated mission. Um, but I think once that's possible, I think um, you know having the ability to have real time video uh, and audio access to kind of if if you're you know your manufacturing plant, your construction site, you know, uh, or even indoors, you know, I think at, at any time is, is really gonna be transformational uh, to a lot of businesses. And I think that's that's gonna be super exciting. So the kind of dock product, I think will enable use cases um, that are gonna be really exciting. That, that's kind of what I'm most, uh, most excited about. Um, COVID-19 question, It um, cash flow. Yeah, so it's a good question. So yes, COVID-19, has affected us and will continue to affect us. Um, so the, the first serious impact uh, from COVID-19 was there was a period of time where we had to shut down manufacturing. And so we literally were not producing product, right? Uh, we, we manufacture our drones in the US, we manufacture them at our headquarters uh, in Silicon Valley and, and, and now at a second site in the US. Um, and so there was uh, a three to I think three month period perhaps where, um, we weren't able to, to work and, and, and produce drones. And so that obviously had a serious impact on our numbers uh, for that quarter as well as for the year um, and has left us in a state where we're still uh, on back order uh, for products uh, on the consumer side. So if you order a drone now, 
I believe you get it within about 45 days, um, which is down from, I think, 90 days at the height, right? Uh, right when COVID hit. Uh, and so, you know, even though we've been scaling manufacturing and we were in the, in the process of scaling manufacturing, um, you know, I think COVID, um, COVID had that impact. Then it also, of course, um, you know, I think there's a period where, you know, people weren't really going outside uh, either to conduct business or to, to play, right? And so kind of the, the use, you know, a lot of the use cases uh, weren't super appealing uh, at the time as well. Um, and then of course there's, you know, always supply issues that uh, are, are caused by COVID. There's shipping issues. Everything got longer and more expensive to ship, right? So, uh, you know, we're just launching our global kind of international expansion plans when COVID hit. Um, and so we delayed all of those. Um, because of COVID, but, you know, it's, it's, it, it um, so it's definitely slowed us down. I would say it delayed, you know, some of the growth that we uh, were, were expecting or, or were on trajectory for. Um, it didn't, um, luckily we managed to fundraise twice during COVID. Um, and so uh, it didn't, it didn't uh, kill investor interest. And so that's really been great. And so um, that's allowed us to then really scale our company and our business even through COVID, right? Was was because the investment community was still active. I think had that not been true, um, I think we would have been in a, in a very bad situation. Uh, but luckily, you know, um, the investment community was still active, you know, during this period of COVID, and so that's helped us um, kind of grow and and expand, uh, even though um, you know there are definite bumps in the road because of COVID. Uh, which countries are your biggest market right now outside of the United States? Um, so I'm here in Japan, which is our first uh, international market. Um, Japan is really interesting in that it by dollar value actually has the most amount of infrastructure. So, um, you know, th post World War II, there was a ton of new, obviously because of devastation of war, a lot of new construction. And then the booming economic uh, decades, you know, during the economic boom in Japan, Japan um, had very high uh, marginal tax rate. Uh, I think the top rate was something like 60, 65% uh, back during the bubble years uh, and obviously very little military spend. So a lot of that money went to infrastructure uh, instead. And there was a lot of uh, infrastructure that was built uh, during the bubble years and, and after the war. And um, it's now all kind of aged older infrastructure. And of course, Japan suffers from a large number of natural disasters uh, quite regularly. There's earthquakes all the time. Right. Uh, obviously, there was the, you know tsunami um, that everybody remembers from five years ago, but there's or ten years ago. But the, you know, there's been other other um, events that make it you know very important to to regularly inspect this infrastructure, be it buildings, you know, the facade of the buildings, be it bridges, be it dams, be it nuclear reactor plant, everything you can imagine um, needs to be inspected. But then Japan also has the unique characteristic of a shrinking population. Right, and so it's a very rapidly aging and, and very rapidly shrinking population. I believe the population dropped by about half a million people last year, right? And it's just on an accelerating trend now of, of population decline. And so you don't have the labor force anymore to go out and especially these kind of unattractive jobs of you know repelling off a rope off a bridge or a tower and risking your life to do these inspection uh, these inspection jobs. And so um, there's just been a tremendous appetite here in this country for uh, you know inspection by drones or inspection, especially by autonomous drones, right? And so that's, that's been a really great market for us and continues to be a strong market for us. Um, you know, the rest of um, Asia Pacific and kind of Europe is up and coming for us. And there's definitely a lot of uh, opportunities there as well that we'll be capitalizing on over the next year. Um, but Japan, you know, really is kind of, it, it also is perhaps the most advanced in terms of regulatory permissions for what drones are allowed to do. It's not easy to do anything in Japan. Everything's very bureaucratic and, and there's a process for it. But in terms of if you follow the process, what you are allowed to do here is actually uh, ahead of, of most of the rest of the world and, and over the next couple of years will be loosening up even more. And so I, I really think Japan will actually be potentially our strongest enterprise market, including even counting the United States. I think Japan might be number one for us uh, in the next couple of years. And then, of course, um, you know, a lot of Japanese companies that we work with here have interests in Southeast Asia, uh, as I'm sure you're very well aware, right? Um, and so that's that's kind of the the path I think that we'll take to that region as well. 
Jeff is asking a question about your parts, uh, whether they're built in the US or do you have Chinese parts? I'm assuming this is also one of your big competitive advantages with the US government is the fact that you are made in the US. Um, Correct. Uh, given current um, policies that we also see here in terms of who you deal with company wise and so forth. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, our drones are built in the United States. Uh, we do all of our own software and everything. So we flash all the, the software in the United States. Um, and the X2, so we have two drones, uh, the S2, which is our, you know, uh, came out in October of last year and is focused mainly on consumers. And then the X2, which is the larger, uh, longer flight time vehicle that's a little bit more ruggedized and, and we sell primarily for enterprises of government use. Um, they both, oh, sorry, uh, the X2 has uh, no uh, components uh, from uh, the People's Republic of China. The S2 has some plastic uh, and magnesium components, like some non, we call non, non-intelligent components, right? Um, so nothing, no camera sensor, you know, no uh, circuit board, nothing like that um, from China. And, and that is, um, it is a key differentiator for us uh, and it's becoming more and more so now, um, not just in the US, but um, in Japan, uh, in Australia, Southeast Asia, India. I mean, there's really, because of you know either um, political meddling like in the US and, and uh, Australia or uh, South China Sea, South China Sea issues, uh, you know, with let's say Vietnam or, you know, et cetera. Like there's just, uh, or the active war dispute with, with India, right? There's definitely a growing distrust of, uh, you know, or, or let's say a hesitance to be reliant on Chinese manufactured flying IOT cameras, right? Uh, for critical infrastructure or government defense. Right, and so that's definitely been a tailwind in favor uh, of Skydio. Um, you see a lot of uh, the national, the natural reaction for countries is and continues to be, you know, to try and create domestic champions. And so we've benefited from that in the U.S. Um, you know, being a national uh, U.S. company, uh, or a U.S. national, U.S.-based company, I guess I should say. Um, um, and we see efforts in Japan, India, everywhere to to have you know companies within the country uh, get into the drone space, but Again, it's, it's very easy to make a manually flown kind of RC helicopter drone. It's extremely difficult to, to suddenly wake up and say, I wanna make a you know, high quality autonomous drone at scale. Um, and so, so far we don't see any real competition, I should say from, from those kinds of companies. So there's definitely efforts. And we've benefited from the US you know, uh, efforts to, to try and, and uh, support local companies. Uh, and are we, oh, sorry, uh, well, there's been a few questions. How do you see your business going to develop in the next five years? So I think um, it's a good question. I think we, the highest opportunities we still think are around docked drones, doing primarily uh, enterprise missions such as inspection and patrol and then used by government agencies for patrol um, uh, post-disaster and things like that. So I think docked drones is really the future for the whole industry, not just us, right? So if you think about Having a network uh, of you know tens of thousands of dock drones spread throughout the country, uh, you know primarily to to do kind of inspection missions or patrol missions or supervised construction, et cetera, but that can be accessed anytime, you know, in order to perform search and rescue, in order to see post disaster, in order to you know check on an incident on a rail line or at a at a power utility, you know, things like that. So that I think that network where it's almost drone as a service or it's it's even more clear, visual data as a service, right? Real-time visual data as a service, um, I think is is the next five years of, of drones if we're successful. That's gonna be really uh, powerful, especially creating 3D kind of digital twins of the world as we see it and creating this kind of almost Google Earth, like if you can imagine just a complete digital twinning uh, of reality. Uh, I think that'll be a great opportunity. Uh, Hi, Tom. Hi. Hi. Yep. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah. I, I I am really impressed by uh, the video you share about the how the drone yeah. works. But uh, I have a question uh, related to what's been popular in social media, like uh, how the drones can um, serve in the logistics center. So my question is, uh, according to your points of view, uh, I mean, the futures of the drone uh, 
whether the drones can develop to uh, like carry the the item or the thing that heavier than than it buys. So. Yeah, so I, it's a, I think drone deliveries is in a really interesting area um, that's seen a lot of uh, excitement, but the economics of it don't work out yet. And you've identified some of the core issue, which is the payload, right? The heavier the payload, the thing that you're carrying, right? The bigger, the louder the drone is, the more expensive it is to fly, the less places it can fly to. And so, you know, I think a lot of people are really excited by the idea of ordering a pizza or a burrito, yeah. you know, and getting it delivered by drone. The economics of that are actually really bad, <laughs> right? I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's not great. And so, you know, the things that are exciting, I think we're seeing is in the medical world. So mine is a great, great uh, company um, that's really done a great job of this and they're delivering blood, right? Uh, so blood is, is, and medicine, blood and medicine are kind of their, their two uh, or organs if you need like a heart transplant, you know, things like that. Um, you know, that kind of uh, medical, you know, um, products we think will be the, the first kind of look place where we'll see drones um, yeah, grow at scale for delivery purposes. I think larger scale logistics like, you know, Amazon obviously has announced their drone program and, and they've seen some demos. I think we're still at least five years away from that being realistic. I think they're, uh, for the economics of that to really work out. Um, you know, the autonomy portion of that is actually a lot simpler than what we do because you can fly just using GPS waypoints outdoors. And as long as nothing is in your way uh, in the airspace that you're flying in, um, you know, your, your drone will arrive to the, to the destination. It's actually, the, the economics really break down on the, on the dropping, on the landing and takeoff or Sometimes like Google does it with rope, you know, it, it, it winches down. That time that it takes to actually drop or pick up something and the fact that you can only do it in certain locations and that, you know, the safety implications and then all, all the things around that, the battery life uh, of the drone, that's where a lot of the complexity is. And so heavy payloads, I don't see happening anytime soon. I think, you know, for heavy payloads, you'll probably see maybe airport to airport type of, you know, autonomous larger vehicles, but I think for autonomous drones, the heavy payload is, is still a long, a long way up. Um, I don't really think that's gonna be realistic anytime soon. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, w one thing, can, yeah, uh, just uh, one last thing about the, uh, in the future, if the drone uh, has um, many drone uh, uh, in the air, so I don't know whether the government uh, will have the law to uh, for the um, company to manage how the drone fly. <laughs> do you do you have any idea on this? Yeah, so it's it's a it's our it's a big topic of discussion uh, in several governments. And so one of the reasons I mentioned like Japan is ahead, for example, is they've already outlined kind of what they think they would require for that to be a reality: a certain level of safety, a certain level of autonomous uh, of autonomy that if you achieve. They want to, to broadly allow for acceptance. The US has done similar things. Uh, we've seen the same thing in Europe. Australia is moving towards there as well. So we think governments are actually fairly supportive uh, of drones, uh, uh, drones for uh, enterprise uses, drones for delivery. It's actually something today we're seeing most governments support. That being said, you know, it's, it's very possible to misuse drones and do bad things with them, right? Uh, and there's no, good protection yet today. So there's actually a very thriving market right now. It's very early in, in what we call counter drone or counter UAS, CUAS is a new up and coming month. So technologies that allow you to detect and disable or capture drones is a very hot market right now for new startups because you know it is unfortunately quite easy to misuse a drone, right? Um, and so, um, sorry, and the reason I bring that up is because, you know, um, as an industry, that's what scares us the most is people doing bad things with drones and then the government reacting and saying, okay, no more drones. Uh, luckily, so far we haven't seen that. There was a few incidences in uh, the United Kingdom, for example, last year, or maybe two years ago now, sorry, COVID has made time uh, a little bit more fuzzy, but um, in, in uh, Gatwick Airport and Heathrow Airport, uh, both had disruptions due to drones or alleged drones. I think, I think they're not really sure uh, to this day, if there really was a drone or not. Um, but, you know, I think Gatwick, I believe it was $60 million worth of business loss for the airport uh, because of that. And so obviously the fear was that 
uh, it was going to become much more difficult for drones, but luckily that did not happen, right? The governments still continue to actually be more in favor of, of drones because they see the economic benefit, right, uh, of it, especially, you know, from a country management point of view, if you think about, you know, you have a, a high density of your resources in urban areas, but you have a population that's dispersed. And so how do you service that population? How do you get supplies to them in emergencies? How do you get oversight in emergencies? How do you get access, you know, how do you inspect infrastructure in those locations? Um, you know, and they understand that drones really are a huge cost savings for a lot of the types of work that governments need to do. And so I think there's been a lot of support for that uh, from governments. Why don't I run through some of these uh, questions? What drove you to get into drones despite it being a niche market with DJI dominating? and drone delivery. So drone delivery, um, never say never, but we think it's definitely too soon uh, for that to be a real scale business. We think that's probably five plus years away. And so there's no immediate plans for us to get into drone delivery. And then in terms of being in the niche market with DJI dominating, you know, they really were not addressing the use case that we wanted to, which is having a drone film you by itself, right? Without a pilot. Uh, DJI is much more focused on making the best, you know, manual drone for its killed pilots. And, that's, and they make great products for that, but we really want to solve a different problem. And so if you think about, you know, I'm a big fan of, of jobs to be done um, framework for product marketing, right? And if you think about the job to be done, I would say a DJI drones job to be done um, is more to be a fun, uh, it's either to be a fun kind of, you know, uh, remotely piloted uh, product or to allow a photographer who's also a pilot to capture, you know, great shots of landscapes or, you know, beautiful areas or things like that. Our drones joke to be done is really to be a film crew for, for the target to the person, right? To really allow them to be, to be filmed doing an activity like riding your bike, surfing, skiing, being with your family, et cetera, without any input, you know, having it all done autonomously. So that job to be done was not, and is not, I think, addressed by anybody else. And that's the market that we wanted to go after on the consumer side. And then of course, there's the, the enterprise side. Uh, ongoing semiconductor shortage. We have really good relationships in place. So uh, as Steve mentioned, I was the chief operating officer for Skydio uh, from 2018 till uh, uh, August of last year. Um, and, uh, you know, look, we're fortunate to have good relationships, but it's definitely something we are keeping our eyes on full time. Uh, and it's definitely something that's scary um, because it is, it is impacting component pricing. It is impacting schedules. So far, we've managed to, to get ahead of it, but uh, it's scary. Um, what's more futuristic than the current products? Are there any exciting features? <laughs> so uh, nothing to announce, but obviously, I really do think that the, the drone dock will be really transformational, right? Um, and that'll be coming out um, in the near future. Uh, then, of course, it's about um, improving core characteristics, like you know, smaller. So on the consumer side, I'd love to have a smaller, more quiet drone eventually five years from now, something that fits in your pocket, right? And you throw up in the air, that would be great. Um, on the enterprise side, obviously you want long flight time, long duration, something that can fly for a long time um, and, and kind of stay in the air for a really long time. So, you know, there's there's different kind of improvements along those lines that I think that will be incremental over time. Um, that's exciting, but I think the dock really the, is gonna be the main transformative technology uh, in the near future. Um, do we operate training schools? We do not. Uh, oh, sorry, that's a private question. <laughs> but I guess I could, well, I could mention it. So we ourselves, uh, we do have online training. Uh, we do offer online training um, and, and such, but there are uh, other partner companies that provide schools and things like that uh, on our drones and, and we cooperate with them for the schools itself. Uh, what can be done to reduce the price of drones? And what do we see as a tipping point? So, um, Drones, I mean, it all comes down to scale. I think the drones are already fairly cheap. So our, our Skydio 2 consumer drone that you saw in the videos is, is about 1,000 US dollars, 999 US dollars. That is actually really cheap <laughs> if you think about it. And it's only able to be that cheap because we primarily rely on smartphone components, right? And so for hardware pricing, everything is about scale and volume. And so we decided to ride the wave of smartphone uh, component pricing, right? The economies of scale come from using so our 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 cameras you know our, our circuits everything like that uh, or our ICs I should say our chips uh, our SOCs and ISPs they all um, uh, are used for smartphones and other consumer electronics and so that's how we can get them cheap and so we think over time that'll just continue to to get cheaper and cheaper as that happens right uh, and so there's nothing I don't think drones themselves 
uh, are driving down costs. I think it's the fact that we use the same components uh, as smartphones and other consumer products. Uh, and so that'll just continue to, to, to drive down over time. Though, of course, um, the whole business for you know some of these critical component manufacturers is to make improved, uh, constant improvements as well that to keep their prices up, right? So for every, you know, if you, if you buy a two-year-old Qualcomm chipset or you buy a two-year-old, um, you know, Samsung or Sony camera sensor, um, they're very cheap now. But of course, you don't want to buy the two-year-old one. You want to buy the latest and greatest because that allows you to make a lighter weight, higher quality product. And so I think prices will maintain for a while. Um, and I don't think there'll be a big drop, uh, unfortunately, until, um, until there's further pressure because of smartphones or things like that. Um, we cannot take photos inside the water. It's not waterproof. Um, our uh, X2 variant, the larger drone is IP53 water resistant, but you definitely cannot put our drones in the water. There are people who make uh, drone um, boats and drone submarines and drone everything. Um, that's a whole other field that's super awesome and interesting. And those can be used by the way for inspection. They can be used to traffic drugs or stop trafficking drugs. There's a lot of these cases for, for these little submarine and boat drones, um, but um, uh, that's an also, it's totally a separate field from what we're doing. Uh, Jeff's asking, what is your business model? Make, make lots of money, fundraise, burn VC money as slowly as possible. No, um, so it, we, uh, we sell our hardware uh, uh, for the you know, same hardware for consumers as it is for enterprises. So we make one hardware skew and that allows us to benefit for the economies of scale because consumer is a much higher volume market today than, than enterprises, right? And so using the same hardware product allows us to get the benefits of the pricing that we can get for the volume that we have for consumers and bring that to the enterprise market. Uh, but then we further monetize actually the software that I mentioned that we have, uh, we use a SaaS based model, right? So we use an annual subscription based model for the additional software capabilities such as you know, the, the advanced uh, enterprise features or the 3D scan right, capabilities, the autonomous scan capabilities. We do a SaaS-based uh, model uh, where you know, customers will buy one-year licenses at a time uh, and, then, and then hopefully renew every year as, as, you know, as progresses. Uh, and so it's a combination of, of hardware uh, and software, separate software sales on a SaaS-based model. Um, and that's really, you know, I think, uh, for us to grow and continue to grow um, as, a, as a Silicon Valley based software company, that's you know, having a pure hardware business model is, is very difficult, um, very, very difficult um, to, to sustain and grow profitably. And so, you know, software is a very important component to our business model. Okay. I think those are all the questions on the chat. Hmm. How, how are you for Thanks. time now? Are you okay for? I'm we're... okay. Yeah, no, I'm okay. I don't have my next meeting until nine hours from now. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to sleep, I have to sleep somewhere along the way, that's all. But I have nine hours till my next meeting. <laughs> Would someone like to ask the next question, maybe with the mic turned on? It's always good to hear some human voices, not just the chat, but... Uh... Tom, uh, what's the, uh, the future for, uh, for your drones? Um, are you thinking about more than just observation or delivery? Are you thinking about the drones being able to do some manual work? So for example, you, you show how a drone, of course the use case is going under a bridge and inspecting it. Well, if there's something to be repaired, eventually somebody has to go up there and repair it. Is there, is there some minimal functionality where you can like apply adhesive, you could weld, you can do things like that. Is that, how far in the future is that? Is that uh, something that you could do with the autonomous drones? Yeah, it's a great question. There's definitely a need for it uh, that's been identified by customers. There's certain functionalities that that can be done um, by drones that would save a tremendous amount of cost and time if they could do it, you know, as the inspection happens. If if, if somebody remote viewing, you know, the, the, the video stream says, oh, we need to weld here, we need to, you know, remove something, we need to turn a bolt, you know, anything like that, or you can imagine, right? Um, so there are other companies that are working on attachments to drones that give them additional functionality. We are not building those ourselves, but it's definitely something that we'd love to be able to have as attachments to our drones as well in the future. So they can, they can actually do that additional work. And so it really is, and it's the, right, it's the right thought pattern, right? It's just, these are robots, right? So everything we've always imagined, you know, a future full of robots doing kind of difficult menial tasks for us, right? Um, we think drones will be actually the first 
you know, large scale uh, in terms of volume robots that will be put into industry use because it is it is so much better to fly. <laughs> you know, I think uh, there's a lot of exciting uh, advancements in robotics of allowing robots to walk and to walk through debris and like uneven ground and everything like that. Um, but really, if you fly, it's just a lot easier <laughs> to get from point A to point B in any kind of ground environment, right? Uh, and so uh, adding additional capabilities, everything you've kind of thought about robots doing, you know, just think, could a flying robot do that? And that's definitely something that we're interested in longer term. I had another question on military application. So mm -hmm. um, it seems like you might have an advantage with autonomous drones in that, you know, so so people always talk about using swarms of drones. So let's say attack a battleship or something. And um, the, the, the defense against that is using, you know, electronic warfare and, and, and disabling the, the drones on mass and things like that. So so those would be probably you would want to deploy drones that are autonomous that aren't uh, susceptible to to those type of uh, uh, defenses. Is that correct? I definitely think the industry, the industry would want that. Yes, we at Skydio have taken a non-weaponization stance for drones for our drones. So we uh, we we do engage with the military and law enforcement as well. But we only sell drones for reconnaissance uh, purposes. Uh, you know, to kind of get uh, visual data to go in to potentially dangerous areas ahead of humans. Uh, and, and see real time what's happening there and situational awareness uh, and oversight. We uh, have taken a stance against weaponizing drones and especially a strong stance against any kind of uh, autonomous weaponry, right? Um, so we, we, you know, we don't allow that in our terms of service. We don't have any capabilities for it. We don't partner, you know, we, don't, we won't cooperate with anybody doing that. We don't allow them to do that. It's a very strong stance because um, we think, you know, Removing a human uh, decision maker from a kind of a kill command is, is not a direction that the world should be going in. Uh, but it's just our, our there's our, been discussion about having like an international convention on this. So how how is that? That's been discussion by you for years, but is there any um, progress on that? Um, no, I, I don't want. I, I could take an hour just on my cynicism of international. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, the pace at which international agreement happens these days. Um, uh, and I think. I don't know Jeff might have been the same when I when I originally went to law school I thought I'd become an international lawyer and, and like join the UN or something and change the world and then I realized if you want to change the world go work in industry uh, especially in tech you'll have much much more impact sorry I hope I'm not I'm not quashing anybody's dreams or or, or, or judging their their decisions in life but I just uh, I was very uh, I'm very cynical about these things so now there really has been a lot of movement there's been a lot of um, private industry uh, focus recently on ethics and AI. Um, you know, um, some of it controversial, unfortunately, there's been a lot of, of uh, drama recently in, in that field, but it's definitely something that, that a lot of technologists are taking very seriously and are trying to kind of get the industry to align on, uh, but there really hasn't been a lot of movement on the international kind of accords. Um, yeah, well, when I was thinking of agreements, I wasn't thinking of government agreements, so more like a self-regulatory body amongst, yeah. amongst co companies and stuff like that, because uh, I because I would have my... <laughs> I have cynicism on that as well, uh, but um, but but it would uh, you know it's just like in the IT sector with the telecoms, you know they talk about multi-party responsibility yeah. for you know security and things like that, and and that seems like the, the best motive. But you haven't the best path, but you don't seem to to see anything uh, building, and and it doesn't seem like particularly just particular to the drone industry. Uh, I guess you would be. Uh, well aware if there was any strong movement. Yeah, so there is, there is in the non-military contractor side, there is there are drone coalitions, right, uh, industry groups, and uh, there have been official statements by these industry groups for what we call responsible use, and Skydio has kind of been a, a part of that process as well. It does not reach into the military realm. But these are for oh, yeah. these are for you know commercial drones, right? So this is a commercial drone. Alliance, literally, I think is the name of the organization, and other other kinds of organizations like that. But I think on the military side, um, there really hasn't been uh, any kind of at all movement by the industry itself to to kind of come to terms with policies on that. Uh, to be quite honest, and I think, you know, the reality is, um, it's an area with a lot of investment uh, from China. It's a lot of investment from I think, Turkey and Russia, at least some of these other countries, and. You've seen some, um, there's been a couple of devastating drone attacks over the past year or two uh, in the Middle East, I think drone, drone um, oil refineries and such. Um, and so it's definitely an area where um, 
there's a lot of investment happening by uh, players outside of the United States. And so I, I don't know that even if the US uh, based industries or the Western world industries, let's say were, were to align on a program, it doesn't mean that the world would, right? So I think, I think uh, that genie unfortunately is out of the bottle somewhat, right? I think there's a, a few terms, you know, like asymmetrical capabilities, you know, or asymmetrical work where, you know, where it's really possible to use something much cheaper and, and kind of off the shelf to do bad things than it ever has been before. Right, and and that's something that a lot of countries have adopted as a reaction to U.S. military um, might, and so I think you know it's it's really um, it's it's going to just continue to see investment. I think by by all manner of players, both uh, you know the use of autonomous vehicles of all kinds for warfare as well as defense against them. So I, I think unfortunately that's that's already a, a path that uh, some some militaries are already on. Thank you. I think it's also interesting about your background that you mentioned, because we also have a few of our master's students who already did a law degree before going into our business program. And I know your background is similar to Jeff's. And I always think it's good to, you know, students to understand that you can major, you know, you can study X and do Y and Z and so forth. And maybe could you just talk a little bit about your career and how you sort of evolve from, you know, studying law and then I guess getting to business. And obviously it sounds like technology side also in terms of how you sort of educated yourself as you went uh, forward. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I was always interested in technology uh, and, and wanted to kind of specialize in that. And so uh, very early on in my career as a lawyer, I specialized in, in what's a field that's known as technology transactions. So it's on mostly contract uh, drafting and negotiation for anything related to intellectual property for technology companies. So it could be you know, the acquisition of, of assets either through M&A or through a direct purchase of, of intellectual property, be it patents, copyright, trademarks, et cetera, uh, and all the licenses involved. Uh, in terms of, you know, um, I will make this quick side note that I don't know how that job would have been possible before Wikipedia, but luckily Wikipedia had started to exist by the time I was doing tech trends. And so every time I needed to learn the basics of some new technology, just so I had a fun, just so I had an understanding of what it was that we were talking about, I would, I would literally research it primarily on Wikipedia. Uh, and, and, you know, I still remember the first time I had to look up, you know, die cast, you know, uh, for, for chip fabrication. So like, a, you know, no idea what it was, uh, and so went through the whole process. So, you know, I was advising. Uh, we represented, you know, solar power companies. I had to understand, you know, the difference between, you know, a cell and a wafer. You know, all these things. But you just learn, right? Um, right now, I think, you know, there's so many resources available, and it's so exciting. The reason I like Tech Trends is because you get to learn about, you know, the products themselves, and every deal can be slightly unique, right? It's not as cookie cutter as a lot of other types of law. Um, but you know, my my job was still to uh, you know, understand the risks and advise customers on it and also draft the best kind of protections around them and also make sure that they're getting the benefit of the bargain. And so you, if you specialize in, in transactional law, contracts law, you work, your clients for the most part are business people, right? And so you start working with business people. And I think, um, you know, I think after a while you realize that there's really nothing special to it, to being a business person. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's anybody can wake up tomorrow and say they're doing business development. They want to be in business development, and there's no real, uh, you know, test for it or anything. You just uh, you could be good at it, could not. But it, you know, there's there's a lot to learn. But uh, it's definitely open to everybody. And so I think, you know, having kind of supported business people uh, for a while, and then and then taking on more and more of those responsibilities uh, over time gave me the confidence uh, that I would be able to do that part of the job as well, negotiate those those parts of the agreement or contracts um, that, that, you know, that the business person would do uh, and partner with a lawyer. And so I think um, just getting exposure, exposure to that allowed me to uh, have the confidence that I could build the skills, you know, to be successful in it. And then, you know, that opportunity at, at, at Google to switch over to the business side and, and really start uh, running, you know, partnerships and business development for Android and help build that ecosystem. Then also, uh, educated me about a specific industry, which is mobile, right? Uh, just as, as, as it was transitioning from flip phones to smartphones and these modern operating systems. And that allowed me to then uh, really learn a lot about that industry and, and all aspects of it and kind of approach it in a very 
um, and a local, you know, kind of understanding of, of the different components of the ecosystem and the parts and, and how it all plays, and then find therefore opportunities for starting my own businesses in that field, right? So I spent 12 years uh, in and around smartphones, right? So since starting at Android, you know, I did multiple startups in the smartphone space, you know, uh, multiple jobs, positions, different companies in the smartphone space. And it was really, you know, um, exposure to it, you know, that helped me gain domain expertise that then allowed me to, to be successful in that field. So I think, I think, you know, for, for my experience, it's really, it's about curiosity and learning and, and kind of getting comfort in certain areas and then making the leap to that, you know, once you feel like you have significant or sufficient knowledge to kind of make something happen or, or to take a bet on yourself in that space, if that makes sense. No, it sounds good. I mean, that's great advice for our students, right? To realize that they're not locked into a certain area because they studied a specific subject. And that tends Absolutely. to really be the mindset here in Cambodia often, you know, that people feel they can't go in another area because their educational background is different. And and the, the sort of the whole focus on curiosity and so forth, um, I think is something that we really need to emphasize more within our education programs. Great. Some more questions, guys? Everyone is very shy mm -hmm. with the microphone. So. I see another uh, uh, one in text, which is the digital twin is very cool. It's proprietary tech, uh, and it would be exciting in the ARV world. I agree. Um, our proprietary tech is in how we capture the images, mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of the photogrammetry itself, uh, we actually run it on other companies' you know photogrammetry products. So there's a bunch. There's MetaShape, Bentley, uh, Drone Deploy, and others that have. Uh, software packages for taking images and then reconstruct creating a, a photogrammic tree uh, based uh, digital twin uh, of, of what it, of the object. And so that's not at all proprietary to us. There's a lot of uh, these solutions out there and, and we don't actually have our own. We use these third parties as well. Our, our focus is on the capture, right? So, um, you know, making sure that you're getting sufficient coverage of the thing that you're, you're, you're taking the pictures of, that you're capturing uh, all of it, but you're capturing also sufficient overlap, overlap to create uh, what's known as stitching when you stitch together, you know, different photos in order to create a complete mesh. And so our, our IP is all around, uh, or what we focus on is building that capture piece. And then the reconstruction part, um, there's many, many different available solutions. And yeah, I think, it, you know, you're seeing some of this now with even smartphones. Uh, Apple's putting a lot of focus now on uh, depth uh, kind of uh, capabilities on their camera. So you could take the type of photos that you need to get the data you need to recreate 3D objects, um, you know, for, because they believe in the, the kind of this, this phase of computing towards AR and VR in the future. And so this is a lot, there's a lot of um, improvements now in the sensors as well. Um, so again, kind of going back to my point about betting on smartphone sensors, a lot of uh, money being spent right now by Apple and other players in, in the smartphone ecosystem in making you know cameras that can, or sensors that can capture depth information, um, you know more cheaply and, and at lighter weight, lighter cost, uh, lower cost than before, and so that'll benefit you know the ability to have better products that can, that can capture real things that can then be recreated digital twins. So it's, it's definitely an exciting area to get into, uh, in general, not just for drones, but but in general, I think uh, photogrammetry and recreation of of kind of digital twinning of the world is, is going to be a pretty big area uh, for the near future. Uh, what was the most challenging moment for you? How did you manage to keep working in your business despite struggle? So, you know, I think um, going from a proof of concept to an actual, you know, uh, scaled volume company was really difficult and the closest we came to probably death at Skydio, right? Um, you know, the we were extremely disciplined. So I have a lot of uh, hard work experience and what you learn very quickly in startups and hardware is that um, there's, you know, the expression that um, most hardware startups die due to indigestion, not starvation, right? And what that means is that most hardware startups die because they have too much inventory and it doesn't move fast enough. So, you know, I think a great example, um, and I don't mean that purely because it sounds bad, but I think a very instructive example is Anki, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but they were making these, um, uh, intelligent toys um, is the best way to describe it. They had these race car tracks. Um, they were brought on WBC by Tim Cook, you know, during one of the Apple keynotes uh, to show the technology, which were these, um, uh, you know, autonomous, you could race, you know, uh, a car through your phone 
in a control phone on a track, and it would race against other cars that were autonomously being controlled, you know, software driven, right? So you could race against them, uh, like a video game, but in real life. And, and they did it really, really well. And they raised a lot of money um, and they grew to scale, but they were a very seasonal based uh, product company, right? It was, it's toys, especially, you know, expensive toys really have one selling season in the Western world, which is the holiday season at the end of the year. And because, you know, supply chain for certain components, you have to order six months ahead of time, four months ahead of time, you have to make your best guess as to, you know, how many you're going to have. And you always want to grow, especially once you're fundraising, you know, I think they raised a series B, I think they got to. And so, uh, and they had a couple of new products coming out and they were very bullish about it. And it ended up that they were too bullish. And then they suddenly went out of business, right? And this is, you know, hundreds of employees and, and very financed by, you know, well, uh, established backers in Silicon Valley and everything. And, and that's a very common situation for hardware startups to, to die because they have too much inventory or too much commitment, uh, material commitment. And so, you know, we have been consistently back ordered on Skydio 2 from the day of launch. And it's a horrible thing. And, you know, as CEO at the time, like I killed myself trying to, to grow as quickly as possible and scale manufacturing, uh, but we never were able to keep up with demand. And it's, it's unfortunate because you leave money on the table, but that is so much better than the reverse scenario that I just mentioned, which is that you were too bullish, you ordered too much inventory, and then it wasn't selling, right? And then you end up trying to fire sale, liquidate, not accept material. And I've been there as well with previous companies. And it's, it's very, very difficult. And so I think, um, you know, scaling, getting the right kind of um, mindset that we were going to be extremely careful right? No matter how bullish we were on the product, because it's very easy to, there's expression, you know, drinking your own Kool-Aid. It's very easy to love your own products. Um, but until there's proof in terms of market fit, right? Um, you cannot take a too big of a bet, you know, in, in anything. And this, I think even for pure software startups, right? I think, you know, until you know that there's a product that's working and that there's demand for it, you know, um, hiring a bunch of people, spending a bunch of money, you know, I give this advice to startups all the time. They ask me like, oh, you know, should we hire in-house counsel? Should we hire, you know, should we do this? Should we hire this? And I'm like, no, like get a market, you know, find a, make a, you know, find a product that, that has demand and then you'll fix everything, right? Revenue solves all problems. It's something Eric Schmidt used to say at Google all the time, right? Um, you know, don't, don't, you can have the best team and, and fully planned out hierarchical structure with an accountant and legal and HR and everything. If a product's not selling, it doesn't matter to go out of business, right? And then the opposite is true. You can have no HR and terrible practices internally and all these problems. But if your product is selling, it'll all get fixed because you'll have the money to then you'll be able to track the talent, you'll be able to raise the funding, you'll be able to grow, you know, and hire the people that you need. And so Skydio, you know, when we launched Skydio 2, we were roughly 100 people, you know, uh, and that is not nearly enough what we needed to be. And now we're about three times that, right? Uh, and that was, you know, because now we know it was working and now we could, you know, raise funding and, and scale, scale. And so really that's, that's kind of the most dangerous is right before, um, you know, launching Skydio 2, we were running as lean as possible, which is very hard. People work very hard and, and everybody does six different jobs and everything. Um, and, but if, you know, we knew that if it didn't work, that's it, that would be the end of the company. And that's the problem with, you know, any kind of consumer companies, you know, you're, it's hit-based and especially hardware, which you design a year ahead of when you're selling, right? You're, you're making all kinds of bets and hardware really is about compromises, right? You, you cannot make the perfect product. You know, I learned this very, this lesson, you know, for 12 years of smartphones, you know, I, I learned this lesson, right? You know, sure, everybody wants a thinner phone, but they also want battery life and they also want a nice display, but they don't want to get too hot, you know? And so it's all just a question of compromise. And of course it's cost, right? And, and so there's just all these compromises and you make your bets way in advance of the product shipping for which compromises you think you should make and which ones you shouldn't. Um, and then it's, it's, you know, then it's kind of hit or miss and you can, you can have, um, you know, the best smartest team and everything, but if the product's not working in the market, then, then that's it. Uh, and so I think really running lean and having the discipline to really stay lean, uh, you know, until you know there's success is, is very hard, but I think it's probably the most important thing for any startup and, and doubly, or actually more than doubly so for hardware startups, it's literally nothing else. <laughs> Just so many, hard, so many uh, hardware startups die on, on this hill, right? And so I think, I think it's really the most important thing.
Let's see if we can get one more question. And this has been an awesome talk. I've learned a lot also about the technology that I was not <laughs> even aware of. So it's, uh, it's always Thank nice you. to come away with a, a few key points here. I think we have- hey, I can ask one. I, I also oh, have- Okay, go for it. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Kunki. I have a question regarding to the drone can help with the agricultural industry. Is it like they, they also can have a lot or maybe cannot? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So our drones today are not great for agriculture because what you need for agriculture really for the most part is being able to fly for a long time. Right, um, and it's it's mostly outdoors, right? You're trying to just fly over a, a wide area. And so our drones are not well suited for that. For that, you really want a fixed wing drone, not a, not a quadcopter with four propellers. You really want a fixed wing drone. Uh, there's a lot of these drones that actually run on fuel or, or hybrids instead of just electricity. So because battery technology is not there yet. So for agriculture, you know, it's really not um, our drones, but there are definitely drones for agriculture, and that is a real industry. There's everything from you know uh, spraying crops to you know counting your sheep to you know flying around and taking um, not just um, not just images, but um, or sorry, not just what you can see, but using things like lidar and radar to actually the soil check on kind of soil conditions and things like that on the ground, etc. And so there's definitely a lot of uh, opportunities for drones in agriculture that we're seeing, but it's not something that Skydio is, is active in because it's not really our sweet spot for what our drones are. And this again goes back to kind of product market fit, right? Um, you know, we were very kind of focused on the use cases that we're going after and we're very methodical. So we started with consumer, right, with the follow drone, then we went to infrastructure uh, asset inspection. Now we're going to kind of security patrol with the dock, you know, and, and we're very focused on kind of uh, succeeding in these specific use cases and not trying to be the end all be all to, to everything. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Jared, did you wanna that last question? Um, sure. I'll oh, sorry, we have one more. We're gonna, oh yeah. Oh yes, uh, yes, Mr. Thomas, uh, very impressive of your products. Well, but I, I also really exciting uh, about your innovation more about the air, air drone, you know, that would be excited. But I also saw this idea from the Facebook, I share from the Facebook that they drawn the food and drawn, you know, some of the stuff from online, maybe pizza or something. I think it's quite a challenge. If you innovation this product more, that's quite a challenge, you know, like, People maybe from neighbor to neighbor, they can give the food to each other. Maybe, uh, I don't know, but quite very exciting that I just want, would like you to be sure about these uh, innovation products in, for the future. I don't know which company is uh, innovation these uh, products, but quite a challenge for your company too, if you can do that. I know that yeah. it's part of a platform for the government to permit, they have some risks assessment that uh, we should, we should uh, you know, minimize the risk and innovate it further, you know, that's very interesting market and demand it. Thank you, that's a great comment. Yeah, there's um, a lot of examples recently of uh, delivery drones in, in kind of specific areas. So here in Japan, there's uh, an active drone delivery uh, project happening right now where drones are being used to deliver food and mail and other supplies to these small islands, you know, they're a very kind of remote and hard to get to. Uh, and so they're using drones now to deliver to these remote locations. I think that will definitely happen. I think that'll happen um, a lot sooner than the kind of urban area, you know, uh, delivering a pizza or, or a burrito uh, in the city too. You know, the, the, you know I, I, there's, there's a lot of benefits to be had from drone. I mean, er, the one thing that comes up a lot with food delivery is, in urban areas is, you know, you can get it on your balcony so the elevators don't get congested because right now in kind of, you know, in, in kind of the, the urban areas in a lot of the world, you know, elevators for tall buildings are now congested with Uber Eats or, or Gojack or whatever, you know, your delivery uh, company is, uh, you know, uh, and so drones are better, but I think we're very far from that uh, in reality. 
in terms of that making sense. But I think for kind of the remote areas, you know, it's hard to get people there get delivering food. I think that's definitely a really interesting thing. And I think that will require, you know, better and better autonomy over time. So that's a good comment. Thank you. Thank you. And Jared, did you have a question? Yeah, I'll sneak in one more if that's all right. Um, so I'm curious around telepresence. So in in the mm -hmm. case of with your drones, you've got both uh, remote control, fully autonomous, and then kind of uh, semi-autonomous or autonomous aid, I think you called it. Uh, with especially looking in the future with networks of drones and almost drone as a service, like you said, do you see there being, or have you, have you guys, are you looking into the, the world of of telepresence and perhaps someone else mentioned AR, VR, uh, kind of a stereoscopic over 5G maybe telepresence kind of situation or, or do you feel like the autonomy will cover most use cases where that could be beneficial? I think there's there's two, um, we separate into two buckets, there's tele-streaming and there's tele-operation, right? And both of those things are definitely technologies that will come into the near future from us and other companies as well and our need for scaling. So for um, uh, every mobile carrier in the world is interested in drones for that exact reason. So um, here in Japan, every carrier has a drone services division, right? And, and in the US, uh, Verizon acquired a company called Skyward a few years ago, uh, which is a drone services company uh, and set up a, a drone uh, services subsidiary. And the reason for that is this exactly right. They believe that you know 5G um, will enable high bandwidth, low latency communication. You know, ubiquitous uh, high bandwidth, low latency communication, and the drones are exactly like that. Is you know, drones are exactly the perfect kind of use case for that. So everything from uh, you know disaster, post disaster, you want to you know there's an earthquake in an area or a mudslide. You know, you want to um, you know you want to fly a drone manually to the site search and rescue, you want to, you know, uh, have it support people on the ground who are looking um, to, you know, tourism, right? You want to see the Taj Mahal, you know, they'll set up a drone lane, you know, things. That, I think all that is definitely things that will be coming uh, over the next couple of years. Um, and, and it'll be a huge, huge field, a huge opportunity. And then for AR overlays, there are already companies, uh, Edgy Bees is one that comes to mind, Edgy Bees. Um, they're primarily focused on, um, first responders like fire police and then the military, but they do an, exactly an AR overlay over a real live video stream for drones, right? Um, so everything from where are my fire people, you know, my firefighters in the building or in the area to where are friendly people versus not friendly people to, you know, this is this building, you know, any kind of AR information you want, that's their entire focus is, is on overlay, uh, AR overlay over real time video streams. And that is extremely uh, going really well for them. They're doing really well. Uh, and I'm sure they're not the only one, they're just, they're just one that comes to mind, right? So that's definitely an area that I think we'll see a lot of uh, enhancements in as well. And we even did, a, you know, uh, you can also imagine kind of video games, right? Like just AR, you know, create AR uh, objects for you to fly through or whatever. And you can imagine like this, you know, this, this mesh where you're doing, you know, um, you're, you're seeing these AR targets, you know, in your drone, your drone's actually flying in the real world and, and going through these, but obviously it's, it's an AR overlay. So I think those are those are all really exciting things that also are definitely going to happen over the next couple of years. You think uh, with that that there's a place for stereoscopic, uh, so for everyone else, stereoscopic stereoscopic cameras being where you've got two lenses that imitate your eyes, you've got depth depth perception, whereas uh, a standard camera you just have two D. Um, Tom, do you, do you think that there's a place or that stereoscopic uh, live video streaming will have a place in that or? or oh, yeah. for sure, for the AR overlays and stuff. Yeah, I, for sure, okay. for sure. I think they'll have to be a fundamental part of it. And again, I think on the just pure entertainment side, I think a lot of the um, reason Apple and, and others are putting so much effort into being able to capture that stuff, including depth, right, on their phones is, is to lay the groundwork for exactly that. Right, so I think you'll see it not just from drones, but from, from other types of capture devices as well. There's also, there's, I mean, there's, um, you know, indoor use case, if you want to do a real estate showing for a house, you know, you can take a stereoscopic a camera and create a very realistic 3D recreation that people can walk through. If you put, you know, goggles on, you can actually walk through the house. 
and see it in real time, or you could put furniture and, and see what furniture would look like. There's all kinds of use cases that I think are going to boom. So it's definitely guaranteed that that is, a, that is an industry that's going to see a lot of development and interest over the next few years. Great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so should we wrap things up now? Is that, because um, I think we're already yeah, about an hour and a half. So we are definitely over time. Uh, again, I wanna thank you for an amazing talk uh, this evening. The videos were fantastic. It really gave a, you know, a, a little bit more visual aspect of, of the technology. So uh, um, I, you know, that was great. And I think we had some good questions also from the- uh, yeah. Um, I hope I just hope you can come back to Phnom Penh sometime. I mean, the last time it was not a fun experience, I guess. So uh, um, we would certainly love to have you come back at some future point, and then you can actually come and, and speak to our students live. Which uh, Zoom is great, but obviously live is always better. And uh, but again, really much appreciate for your spending your time uh, this evening from Tokyo with our class and a few external guests, and uh, and looking forward to again hopefully meeting you back in Phnom Penh at some point. I look forward to it. I definitely enjoyed my time there, even though I was quarantined uh, you know, in my hotel room. I was there for 16 days and I was quarantined 14 of them. So <laughs> I didn't get to see too much of the country, but uh, from what I could see, I, I really enjoyed it and I'd love to go back. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, okay. I really appreciate it. And Steve, thank you for the kind invitation to, to talk. I, I really enjoyed it. And I really did, the questions actually were really good. Uh, I was actually really impressed by the quality and the thoughtfulness of the questions. So thank you, everybody. I really do appreciate that very much. Okay, thanks again. Take care. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Good night. Good night.